Welcome back, everyone. Open line. We are talking with the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Tennessee, Hetty Weinberg, talking about the past year, what's coming up this year. Um, and, and as I went to break, I mentioned police body cameras. That has been an issue major here in Metro. It's really a big issue everywhere. How are you all? What I kind of? What's your perspective on this? Um, How are you involved? Kind of talk about police body cams and some of the issues there. Sure, and and we're not actively involved right now. We were, um, you know, the the issue right presented itself after dealing with some brutal, very painful killings of black men by police officers across the across the country, and there was recognition that how do you begin to at least either identify what's really happening in those incidents in those situation and how do you hopefully make law enforcement aware that they cannot just you know suddenly grab their gun and shoot it and I'm not saying that's always what happens but there was there is a lot of concern there's a lot of perception and we've seen killings of black men by officers so police body cameras was placed out there as a possibility. Let's ensure that officers wear cameras, be it on their you know, ear, their mm -hmm. forehead, and, and any time they have contact with an individual, they turn the camera on. So there was a lot of conversation, and about four years ago, ACLU actually worked with a couple legislators and drafted a bill where we weren't taking a position on body cameras, but about the policy if you because everyone says body cameras body cameras right but you know if you have a body camera and law enforcement officers don't know when to use it how to use it and that the footage is not then available after an individual has been killed or you know wounded in a way excessive use of force then what's the use you need to present that footage early on to the community so that either people can see the, the officer was not at fault this is the only thing they could do or why did this happen right there was not another you know weapon there was not the need to 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 wound to kill the individual so we got into a lot of conversation about just how do you how do you draft that policy and who should draft it and who should be making decisions? The media who wants access immediately, the yes. community who wants yes. ac who wants and deserves access immediately, certainly when loved ones are are, you know, killed or, or excessive use of force is taking place. Law enforcement who says, Yes, we want them, but we don't want the footage available. ACLU had a particular concern about privacy to ensure that the camera shouldn't be on all the time because when the officer is having a break or talking on the phone, having a cup of coffee with his partner, their partner, camera shouldn't go on. Camera should only go on when you are engaged in a contact with an individual. Right. Camera um, should, footage should not be available to this ACLU's belief that when you stop someone for speeding, and you find out that there's some famous, you know, star, that footage is not necessary. It's not necessary for the footage of you to be made available or me or some famous person or some individual who happens to live down the block. That footage, why is that necessary? It's when you're trying to understand what just happened when excessive use of force or a so fatal you, shooting So you were helping place. to draft a policy, uh, I guess, statewide in the legislature? Yeah. And is there a policy now or it's still there is not there's a not a policy now. so we were trying to actually we were trying to draft model policy okay. so that local law enforcement agencies would adopt it but what you have now is and then we surveyed a lot of local law we surveyed i think actually all local law enforcement agencies some responded some didn't to find out do they use body cameras this was several several years ago do they use body cameras and do they have policies and do you know a lot of agencies have used body cameras, but they don't have policies. That's a real problem for everyone, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. officers, for communities at large. There have been some really wonderful activists and very engaged activists in Nashville who have been really working hard to get the police chief and others to not only 
drive policies, but more importantly, put out the police body cameras. We right, just saw they're very expensive, and that's been also part of the talk here. And You're not involved here in Nashville. We're not involved, point. but but let me talk about the expense a little bit. Some of what the problem is is storage, and our position is these these this footage should not be stored forever in a day. There sh the policy should be very clear on how long the footage is stored, mm -hmm. so that if something does develop, the footage is still there. But you know, I think in our policy it was six months. But people, some of the storage is what's very, very expensive. And I think I haven't looked at how the budget was played out, but it was millions of dollars that they were saying. And I think it's really important to go back and look at that number and really understand what that means. Um, it's very disconcerting, though, because a promise was made several mayors ago, um, you know, that there would be police body cameras, and, and since we've seen a succession of mayors, we haven't we seen have them, right. body cameras. And that's been frustrating yeah. for a lot of people. And it's, it's, it's about life, you know, life and death and understanding what's really happening. And body cameras serve a purpose for law enforcement, too, because it protects them sometimes from the, the allegation. You talked about voter. You talked about that one bill um, that has been criticized and that we've talked yeah. about as far as voter registration. Um, it's been criticized as voter suppression. Yes. Are there some other voter issues um, in this upcoming year that, that the ACLU will be focused on? You know, what about voter issues this year? Sure. Um, I think an issue that we've been working on for quite some time and we're working in coalition with partners focuses on what we call voter restoration. Most people don't know that individuals with felony convictions lose their voting rights, okay? There's a lot of media about what happened in Florida where um, there was a ballot initiative which meant that Floridians got to vote on whether or not individuals should, with felony convictions after completing their prison sentence and probation, parole, should get their voting rights back. And by a fabulous majority, Floridians said yes, they should. Now, unfortunately, the Florida legislature then went into the General Assembly and passed a law that said, well, they can only get them back after they have done A, B, C, D. Um, and ACLU and NAA have a lawsuit in Florida. But in Tennessee, we're in a situation um, where there are some individuals based on their conviction where they can never get their voting rights back if they have a felony convictions. They have all, there are others who can get their voting rights back if, and it's a long line, if they have completed their prison sentence. There are only two states that allow individuals with felony convictions to actually vote while they're in prison. So okay. we expect that, though our vision would be that everyone should always vote. but have to uh, finish your prison sentence, have to complete parole and probation, mm -hmm. have to pay back restitution and court fines and fees, and, and we're the only state in the country that does that, require you to be current in child support. Wow. So as you might imagine, let alone the burden of then getting that certificate of restoration which you need in order to register, you have all these other obstacles. Court fines and fees and child support. Our research has shown that um, over 80% of the people who have been denied their voting rights back, it's because they're not current in child support. Right. In this state, um, being locked up in prison, they identify that you're voluntarily unemployed. If you're voluntarily unemployed, then you should be paying child support. So you owe child support, and there, it's the rearage, right? You owe all the child support that has been accumulating since you've been in prison. We're not talking, and this is what's so important to focus on, we are not talking about waiving court fines and fees or getting rid of the child support you owe. We're talking about allowing your voting rights to be restored right. once you've leave, left prison and completed parole and probation. And recognize that the goal, you know, when you talk about criminal justice reform, you're talking about helping people reintegrate into the community. There are lots of things people need to do when they leave prison, be it for two, after two years, three years, you know, decades, some people Do you think up. this has, um, could this, become law this year? I mean, wh we where, where do you think we are? We have a wonderful coalition of folks working together. We have 
um, sponsors who are committed. We will come back and talk to you again, but there are a range of folks that are impacted people, people who have lost their voting rights, who are committed to having their voice heard. ACLU and others have worked with um, individuals to help them get their voting rights back if they have already completed um, parole, probation, and so we're going to hear a lot more about this. You'll be hearing Can a lot more, and it's a really important issue because it's about second chances. It's right. about re-entry and reintegration, so that everyone is a productive, involved, engaged community member. All right, we'll take another break. Be back. We're right after this.